Well, let's go ahead with 5A, revisions to electrical regulations. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. I'm David Hornbacher, the Executive Director of Longmont Power and Communications. And with me tonight is Carrie Spots. And Carrie is our meter supervisor. And she's going to provide a, uh, a short presentation and a brief overview of the proposed changes to the regulations governing electric service. These regulations, these proposed changes will be for City Council at the next regular council session. And Thank you, Mayor Bagley, City Council members. As Dave stated, I'm Carrie Spots with Longmont Power and Communications, Meter Shop Supervisor. And I'm here to present the revisions to the city's regulations governing electric services here. Some of the items we'd like to discuss are metering, clearance, connections to service facilities, and definitions. On the electric metering and clearance, um, we are now offering a lever bypass type meter housing. In this type meter housing, oh, I thought I was going to have an arrow. So the top lugs inside that meter housing are the connections from the city facilities and you can see on the slide the lever with the red handle um, that is the actual lever bypass and this is a win-win for safety of electric personnel and it also um, gives the convenience of no power outage for the customer during any type of meter maintenance. So we would be able to engage the, the bypass lever, take the meter out of the socket, and do any maintenance, checking you know, for any issues that may be happening there, um, plug the meter back in, re-engage the lever bypass, and button it up all while the customer isn't inconvenienced with a power outage. Um, new phenolic badging makes it easier to read the address where um, we're standing. Um, this really helps it make it easier for nighttime outages. Um, a lot of times our personnel are called out to respond to an outage. We want to make sure that we're at the right location and looking at the right installation. The older brass badging was very difficult to read. And as you know, apartment buildings are maintenance, they get painted. Um, a lot of times the, the painting personnel wouldn't acknowledge the brass badge and they would paint over it, which made it twice as difficult to try and read. Where are we? <laughs> Where are we? So the phenolic badging is a really great thing, helps us really identify where we're at. Locating the equipment on the exterior of the building um, helps us to, to ensure access to the equipment that we're called out to. Also helps us with uh, future, ugh, <laughs> excuse me, troubleshooting for, for outages and streamlining and basically making making it to industry standard. Many utilities are requiring this so that they have the access, and it's very easy to maintain and troubleshoot the equipment for the customer. New metering options for 400 amp services. Now have an installation like this. A lot of customers now have electric vehicles. The standard years ago used to just be a 200 amp service. This type of convenience takes up less real estate on a customer's home or even on a business, and the equipment's very accessible in this instance as well. Master metering considerations for multi-dwelling units. We like having the contact with our individual customers, being able to reach out to them, talk with them in the public. On some instances though um, such as a memory care facility or an, an assisted living facility it makes it harder for those individuals to maybe remember to pay their utility bill so master metering is an option 
for for those that get approval from our executive director of electric services. Electric metering and clearances, clarifying the physical clearance requirements from the electrical equipment. Sometimes landscaping gets in the way. And this time of year, it makes it kind of difficult when it's under snow or frozen under ice to be able to actually access the door for the utility pedestal. Whether it's plants, fencing, or other obstructions. Who was teasing that sweet little German? He scared me to death. <laughs> I, I was called out for um, a tripped breaker and a cut seal. Um, the customer had tried to flip their own breaker, which is located in that electric pedestal there to the left. And I noticed that the fence is blocking the face of the pedestal, so I couldn't get the door off. And then when I tried to enter the yard and knock on the door to let this customer know what I was there for, um, the dog came from around the back. <laughs> Good boy. Good boy. So, you know, we're just showing that, you know, landscaping can still be beautiful and still giving access to the electric equipment because our customers depend on us for that reliability of their electric service. Connections to service facilities. This is an electric transformer. So this is um, owned by LPC. And you can see they're kind of on the left where the paddles are with the four holes in the, in the paddles. There's limited connections that can be made in this type of cabinet. So for apartment buildings, they would need to a lot of times maybe purchase four or five of these transformers for just one of their buildings. So one of the options is to allow them to install, own, and maintain a secondary cabinet like this. The picture's a little dark, but you can see there's lots of room for a lot of the wires and conductors then coming from the transformer into the secondary cabinet. And then definitions, we've updated, you'll notice your redlined copies that you all received. It takes a village to make these types of changes, update things, and really bring things into utility standards. So some of the definitions that we changed were um, from general manager to executive director of electric services. Um, we used a lot of terminology like a CT because we were familiar with the term, but maybe the regular public wasn't. So a CT is a current transformer, or a PT is a potential transformer. In a lot of the code, we talked about the developer, or the owner, or the customer, and really streamlining that, because a lot of these facilities, you know, from, electri uh, from apartments, go from a developer during the construction stage. Then they go into the owner of the apartment complex. Then they go into the customer or tenant who lives there. But they're all our customer. So really just streamlining all of that. Thank you for your time and consideration. Mayor Pro Tem, Rodriguez. Well, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So I guess to a certain extent, just to reiterate, outside of, of some upgrades to, say, the construction uh, issues as far as uh, the bypass, as well as for folks that are desiring upgrades to their 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 boxes, uh, this will have no material significant. Th this will have no material change to rates for our electric payers currently. It would be a one-time kind of deal if they did decide to get an upgrade to their box for, say, electric vehicle charging. You are correct that this would not have an effect on rates, and several of the things that we showed tonight actually are a direct cost savings to the customer installing those new services, and they would realize that cost savings directly. To the first annual report on inclusionary housing. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kathy Fedler, Housing and Community Investment Manager, uh, Division Manager for the City. Um, and I will try and be succinct, but there's a lot of information here. So 
Um, I'll go as quickly I won't, as I, I won't can. yell at you. I get it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so first, I'll start with the inclusionary housing program snapshot um, over the past year. Um, there's about 20 projects under um, development um, that were are fall under the ordinance. So if you remember, the ordinance became effective at the very end of last year. And so the projects that just started did not have their final plat approvals <clears throat> prior to, um, or their preliminary preliminary plat approvals prior to um, the effective date of the ordinance fall under the ordinance. So as you look at construction around the community, there's many developments that are not under the ordinance and right now there's 20 in the development review process. Um, nine of those have already committed that they're providing their affordable housing units on site. Um, five are making a uh, fee in lieu, they've already decided that and eight are undecided and the nine the five and the eight add up to more than 20 um, because some of the developments are doing both fee and lieu and units or are doing multiple um, types of units so of the um, 10 total developments that are providing homes on site five of them are rental projects and five of them are for sale um, projects of the rental projects, uh, there's a total of 789 units within the rental um, developments. 230 will have, um, there will be 230 affordable homes, and the majority of those affordable rental homes will be provided within the market rate rental development. Of the for sale um, projects, there's a total of 1,400 total for sale units within those projects. 52 affordable homes will be provided on site, and the majority of those affordable homes will be provided in partnership with nonprofits. <clears throat> For the fee in lieu, um, projects that are saying that they would like to make the fee in lieu, um, there's five total developments on that as well, three rentals and two um, for sale developments at this point in time. With 48,000 is the estimated amount. We will not know the finals on these until we actually um, start seeing building permits um, and certificates of occupancy issued. Um, and then about 1.4 million is estimated under the two for sale um, developments. <clears throat> Those are anticipated to come in over a period of time. Um, we're anticipating about maybe just under 400,000 coming in in 2020. Again, those are paid at their fee and, uh, at their certificate of occupancy, so they usually come in at the end um, of a project. Um, and then about, I just kind of evenly split the, the rest of it um, between 2021 and 2022, looking at the developments and where they're at in the process and when they're likely to, to come in. Um, there has been some interest in middle tier um, building um, and I have to stress that again these developments are still in the review process and have not yet committed to um, or signed an agreement committing to providing the middle tier homes to know what tier they want to fall under or if they're even going to do it um, but the two um, projects that are in process and have said that they're looking at doing that um, one is at 1901 South Hover um, and they um, indicated to Planning and Zoning Commission when they went before them that they'd provide about 209 units in the 101% to 110% um, middle or tier and a, a 27 in the 111 to 120% tier. And then if you remember Mountain Brook um, satisfied some of their affordable units with the um, Veterans Community Project and the Habitat Projects um, and they that covered some of their units but not all of them. So there's still about 49 unsatisfied units that we're working through um, what that's going to look like. So at some point those 49 units will either be provided under um, one of the tiers or they'll make the fee in lieu. So we'll know as, as we learn more we'll, we'll let you know about that. So looking at the current market housing snapshot, um, this indicates the um, changes in median sales prices over time. And what you'll notice in um, 2019 is that prices are starting to level off, at least in the median area, and it actually is um, reflected in the average sales prices as well. Um, so there was a 1.3% increase in detached homes from 2018 to 2019, 
and a 0.74% decrease in attached homes. Um, some of this leveling may be due to more homes being available to purchase. There was a 5% increase in um, the number of units available um, from 2018 to 2019 in the detached home product and an 11% increase in the attached product. <coughs> New homes versus existing home sales. So um, again, looking at um, past years as well as um, the most recent current year, um, new homes are becoming a greater part of home sales, increasing from a low of 4% in 2020, uh, 2010 to a high of almost 29% in 2018. And then it uh, dropped a little bit in 2019 with new homes making up 22% um, of all home sales. The income needed to purchase or rent in Longmont um, is shown on this chart. Um, and you can see in 20, about 2012 is when a family at uh, making 80% of the area median income and at our city median income can no longer afford to purchase a detached home. Um, and then 2015 was when both the 80% um, area median income and our city median income wage earners could lo no longer afford um, the median cost of an attached home. And then the rent is the purple line, uh, the income needed to afford um, rents. And the dashed purple line is the 50% um, HUD median income um, for a two-person household. So that shows that it's been as well uh, quite a while since um, household, two-person households, one and two-person households could afford our median rents. So this is new information. We just got it, so it was not included in, in your packet. This is from the draft consolidated plan, which is being put together right now, and they're still pulling a lot of information together. But this shows that our greatest rental housing need is for um, households and families at um, that make at or less than 40% of the area median income. Um, inclusionary housing rental projects are providing, um, oh, and it says renal, sorry, instead of rental. <laughs> projects are providing um, primarily 60% area median income units um, where um, if you look at the, um, that area gap, which is about the 50,000, to 75, no, it's probably the 35 to $50,000 range, there isn't really a need, or there isn't a gap showing. Um, so we have a gap of 2,300 units. Right now we're looking at providing 230 units through inclusionary housing with, again, the bulk of them at 60% area median income. So there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Um, and quite frankly, um, for market rate development to be able to reach 40% and below without um, some greater subsidies than what we're currently providing just under the um, our affordable housing incentives is difficult. So trying to get some of those units through the um, affordable housing fund application process or CDBG funds, et cetera, is where we um, really need to focus efforts to get those, reach the, those units. So 2019 sales, this shows um, new and existing home sales. There were a total of um, 1,440 total home sales in 2019. Um, I want to say that we do need to still do a lot of scrubbing of this underlying data. This came from the Boulder County Assessor's website, and uh, my staff and I tried to do some of this and didn't get too far into it because it does take a lot of back and forth with looking at addresses and going to the website and um, looking at a lot of different information. But um, what we found was that some in the area that's below 80% um, AMI, and we assume also in that um, 81 to 100%, are related to investment buys and flips. Um, some of the lower sales prices turned out to be a deed or a trust transfer. Um, so actually just paying a little bit in order to do that transfer of the deed from one person to another, um, and not actual sales. So. Um, we scrubbed quite a bit out of it, but um, not totally. Of the seven new sales that are below 80% that are showing there on the chart, um, four of those are the Blue Vista homes that are affordable, so starting to see some of that under the inclusionary housing program, um, and three are townhomes that are in non-inclusionary housing developments. 
Um, and then 2019 sales by type of home. Um, this shows that um, the majority are um, still single family. Um, and um, single family homes in this case includes townhomes, but not condos. So it's a little bit different than how we normally talk about detached and attached. The assessor's office just does it differently, which is another area why, where if we have more time to scrub the data, we could pull those, that information out. So this just shows um, that all homes um, are at the very top, um, the lightest blue. Single family homes are the, the next line down, and then the, the bottom line or the darkest color are our condo units. So for single family homes, um, 2019 sales, um, this just shows the difference um, in, by the area median income prices, sales prices. So about um, 93 homes were available um, in single family um, or townhomes um, at 80% of the area median income. Um, and you can see the different um, calculations there. So it's just trying to give you a breakdown of those sales prices affordable at the differing um, AMI levels. And then this just shows um, new home sales versus um, all uh, exist all home sales for single family um, and townhomes. New homes. Mm -hmm. New build. The new builds are yes, are the blue. Okay. Yep. Um, the interesting thing here is that um, single family new homes are trending to higher priced units, unlike the existing market. Um, which still shows the majority of homes in the 81 to 100 percent AMI tier, um, which is that 300,000 to 430,000 dollar price range. And also, since single family um, in the single family category includes townhomes, that may be that may be why that's skewing high um, in that particular AMI category. Just just a quick question: uh -huh. the I know the definition of AMI. But are we, this 81 to 100 on the previous, that one, mm -hmm. the 81 to 100, 101 to 120, and greater than 120, is that, um, is that based on their income or is that based on the house price? It's the house price that equates to that um, AMI range. And so we're not comparing that to the actual home buyer. We're Correct. just saying that home has that price and it it's should affordable. generally be affordable to people Understood. in that income range okay okay yep. can i add, can we add just just on that and, and what per, is it 30 or 30 percent of of their income at that ami for housing costs um we use the 33 percent that Based we use we for sale our current sales prices. so it's all 33 yep. across the board mm -hmm. okay Okay, then this just shows the breakdown of sales by condos um, for the condos for 2019 sales. Um, 13 homes uh, were available at 80% and below, and then um, the bulk of them at um, 81 to 100%. No, sorry, this one's the 101 to 120% AMI. And then again, showing uh, new home sales versus um, all home sales for condos. Um, and it's interesting that there are there were no condo sales that um, were affordable at or below the 80% figure. Okay, so looking at our affordable housing goal, how are we doing um, in our progress towards that? Um, we need to create about 200 new affordable homes annually while maintaining and preserving all existing affordable homes to meet the goal. And right now we're about 3,000 units short, um, which kind of ties right in with that 2,300 rental unit gap as well. Um, although we know we do need um, for sale housing as well as rental housing. Currently we're at 6.06% towards our goal or of our um, total housing stock is um, affordable. A little while ago we were at 6.2%, but we didn't have a very large gain in 2019 of units created that got their certificates of occupancy versus the number of new total new home that were added to the city. <clears throat> On our pipeline of uh, affordable inclusionary homes that are coming up, um, this shows um, 
what we're anticipating. So 2018, we had 113 units that were produced, six units in 2019 um, with a little bit of issue with getting certificates of occupancy. And then projecting forward um, using estimated permits from planning and development, um, and then our um, estimated affordable housing units coming in through inclusionary um, housing. So since none of these estimates get us to our 200 um, per year, we also need to be looking at acquisition of market rate housing and converting it to affordable with subsidies or other um, new construction um, alternatives. <coughs> so metrics, uh, this doesn't look too good. Should have broken this slide up a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at and tracking is changes in building permits and how those changes in our permits compare to state and or our surrounding communities. Um, changes in median home sale prices and rent prices and their impacts of that on the inclusionary housing goal. Does it need to change, stay the same? Impacts on our AMI t targets. Do we need to raise or lower those or um, adjust those at all? Um, and then um, providing information on what the market is providing. Um, how the units are being provided, so are we seeing a shift towards all on site, all fee and lieu, that kind of thing to report back on that. Um, and whether or not when we start getting fee and lieu, is that sufficient to replace units? Or what are we getting for the funding that, um, that's coming in? Um, we'll also be tracking obviously our 12% goal attainment um, and then who is being served with the, the program once we get things up and running around demographics and AMI levels, et cetera. So as noted in the council communication, some of the trends that we're noticing um, in a number of projects, um, both for sale and rental are choosing about the same proportion of making the fee and lieu to um, providing units. Um, we'll keep tracking that obviously and see if that, um, the eight units that are eight projects that haven't decided yet, how that works. Um, the rental affordable housing units are primarily being provided within the, the development. Um, and the greatest area of rental units needed below 50% and really below 40% area median income are um, well below what is actually being provided with 68% of the inclusionary housing rental units at 60% of the area median income. So for future um, upcoming uh, council sessions, uh, some of the things we're looking um, around code cleanup and code um, changes um, are looking at if somebody's doing renovations to existing housing um, and are creating new um, dwelling opportunities within that um, renovation, does the inclusionary housing apply to that? Um, other residential dwellings, um, if they are changing the type of dwelling uh, unit that they're providing, does that um, have inclusionary housing provide a change? All of these, these things that are here in, within this, um, these four bullets, insert bullets, um, are things that have come up because they need a site plan modification or something that triggers, otherwise would trigger inclusionary housing, um, but some of them just don't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, property line adjustments is another one. Um, and then changes to type of units. So if a development was planning on doing single family detached and wants to switch to townhomes and they're gonna provide more units, does that trigger something? Um, and then again, we've talked a little bit about um, whether or not we should uh, amend the code to allow direct donation of land to nonprofits as opposed to going through the city or um, alternatively coming back with a voluntary alternative agreement to allow them to do that directly. All right, let's go ahead and ask the city staff to present the Safe Lot Research presentation. Um, this is really a team effort, and I have my team nearby. Uh, Chief Satter, uh, Joseph, uh, Joni, and myself are what make up the, the, the research piece of the, of the task force. And I'll go, this is, this is a progress report. It is not a final report. Um, we are still researching and, and looking into different models. This is happening here in Longmont um, and other places. And this, this, the, the background is this really started uh, and came out of our council conversations on homelessness. 
Uh, we've had three, we had three in, in uh, 2019 where we presented some data around what we know around who is experiencing homelessness. And in our September uh, council conversation, Joseph brought up the idea of a safe lot and council then mandated or tasked staff to create a task force to do some research into the safe lot model or safe parking, I will also, it's also known as safe parking. If you ever just want to Google it, is there, there is more and more stuff being written about it. So this is the, the whole task force. Uh, Joni Marsh, Jeff Satter, Joseph Sadovich, myself, Amy Scriver, Mike Butler, uh, Jared uh, Van Dellingham, uh, Karen Roney, and, and Harold Dominguez is on the task force. Um, we quickly met and decided that we were going to try and divide and conquer some of the questions that council had around what is the most viable model, who's experiencing it, and there's a question of, of, of return investment. So what do we know about what type of systems capacity, housing systems capacity we have that investing in this model, what, what kind of return on investment will we get versus investing in more housing or uh, bridge housing? So we broke up those three uh, into those three teams of the task force. Um, and we very quickly decided to decide we needed a purpose. And our purpose as a task force is really to understand what are the current gaps in the countywide systems to move people out of homelessness and into stable housing and to explore what are some temporary options that we have to address those gaps while HSBC works on bringing new housing resources. As you know, uh, council approved some new housing resources in the 2020 budget, which we're very grateful for, and we are working on getting those online. However, in the meantime, there are still gaps, and how can we address those gaps? And really, the safe lot option is one of many options that we can look at that may serve as bridge housing to try and get people to that final uh, goal of being housed. Uh, so again, these are the three teams that we created, the research team, uh, the data team, and the capacity team, the system capacity team. Um, this, the research team did a lot of work on best practice research, and there is quite a, a spectrum when it comes to safe parking models throughout the country, primarily there in the west, uh, northwest in California. But there, even though there is a quite the spectrum of different models of how they work, some are bigger, some are smaller, uh, some uh, serve RVs, some serve cars. There are some general best practices that are found in all of them, uh, for, the, for the most part. One is most, if not all, have case management that leads to a stable housing situation. So the idea is how do we get people housed? All of them provide overnight parking and some provide more, very few provide more than that. Uh, most pr programs at this point don't allow RVs, and we'll go into that question in a second, uh, is primarily a cost issue. Um, and they all provide some kind of access to restroom facilities, and they, most of them provide some kind of security. And, and that can be done in, in a spectrum of ways as well. I've seen everything from you know, private security guards, firms, to volunteer security, and that, that of course affects cost. Um, but those are kind of the, 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 what you see in the models throughout the, the country. Those are the things that they tend to have. Um, this essential elements uh, piece I added because I read this very interesting study done by the University of Seattle's law school. And they were looking at... I'm going I'm to cut you off. I need to go. Okay. So I've got, it, my, I've got a family member that just went to the hospital that oh, cool, I need to go. Sorry. So Mayor Pro Tem's in charge. So... I apologize. No I'll worries. call you after to get filled yeah. in. Okay. Thanks. Yes, and I hope your family member is, is doing well. So this study looked at what are the essential elements of successful programs uh, throughout the country. And they really came down to three key things and being very intentional about them. Uh, I'm going to quickly cover the first two, but then I'm going to focus a lot on the third one. Um, one is funding sources. You know, the, the, the study looked at three case studies, and each of those case studies, the, they were funded in different ways. Some were funded by primarily private donors, some were funded by government. And funding um, and connections to funding can also lead to different uh, limitations on how the program m works. So, for example, when you get government funding, there's a lot of government strings attached to it, whereas when you get private donor funding, it may not be as um, stable as government funding, but it, it, it may open up 
different avenues of how you deliver the services. Uh, then the second one is key relationships. It, each of those successful models had developed key relationships with both uh, municipal staff and in particular with the police department. The most successful ones had very strong relationships with local police departments. The final one, reputational capital, I thought was very important. That one focuses on wherever a model is held needs to have that reputational capital with the, the neighborhoods where they are located. Uh, there needs to be strong community engagement uh, and strong community voice in how that model is delivered. Uh, those three things together really pro are is the fundamental basics of making successful models. Uh, we know that. Uh, that's what that study showed. So, and Joseph is here, so you can talk more about his, but Hope's, part of our research team was also to get information from Hope on their safe lot pilot. Now, as a reminder, this pilot is being done by Hope without any formal city resources or vetting by the HSBC system at this point. Uh, and I want to correct, because Joseph uh, graciously uh, corrected me on my report, and it was also in the paper. Um, in the report, it talks about um, Joseph, or uh, the safe lot pilot using navigation um, as kind of its basis for intake. Uh, because this is not funded by the city or the county, Joseph uh, let us know that Hope will be using its own um, intake process. And again, this is a work in process. We're still trying to figure out what that's gonna mean for how do we help people access some of the resources that is within the HPC system. Okay, but I just wanted to point out that correction. Um, but the safe lot provides temporary par parking waiting for housing. It will provide case management and it will add background checks, something that doesn't happen right now. Uh, people living in vehicles, not RVs, primarily, like I said, cost is an issue um, and who are not accessing the, the shelter. And, it's seek and HOPE is seeking to implement two lots, one for adult individuals and then families, uh, a separate lot for families with children. Uh, with a total of five to seven vehicles per lot. I, I think the idea is to be manageable at first, to learn from it, and then decide how to move forward. So here's some of the costs that, uh, we, that, that we researched, and Joni, was, Joni Marsh was extremely helpful in um, finding these costs. This is what it would cost if we were to provide our own RV safe lot. Uh, so we would need connections. Uh, and a dump station that we'd have to create, and that would be from 38,000 to 76,000. We would need, of course, development. Uh, we would need street improvements to make sure that it's a feasible uh, place to park those RVs, uh, and those are the ranges. And these, these are estimates. These are ranges that, that Joni uh, researched. And then if we were to provide a restroom facility, this is the estimated cost. Uh, so it's quite an investment to make. Um, of course, vehicles, and these are, these are the estimates provided by Joseph, are much lower. Um, primarily, it's focused on security uh, and what they would provide. Um, there is a one time, if we go, if Hope decides to go with a shower restroom trailer, there is a one time fee of 30,000, but we're not exactly sure what it would, the maintenance would be on that option or to save some costs, Hope could uh, choose to do uh, portable restrooms. And according to Joseph, it's around $4,000 a year to rent and maintain those um, restrooms. So that is the research team's work, what we're doing. The SafeLot data team, that team uh, is working on trying to find more and more what is the need. And so with the help of Amy Scriber and our GIS folks, we created a survey uh, that is primarily being used by public safety right now. And this is just a snapshot. So this data has not been completely analyzed yet, but I did want to show council, here's the progress that we're making on, on collecting better data. So this is a survey that uh, public safety has uh, on their phones that is helping us capture uh, data around those who are experiencing homelessness that are living in cars and RV. Um, as you can see, the number of folks in 
cars is much less than what uh, people that are living in RVs, and you can see the number between operating RVs and non-operating RVs and car um, operating and non-operating. Um, that those are the numbers that are that are are coming, and we hope to have a much better picture uh, by the end of March. Uh, that that right now is our goal to to finish data collection so that we can come back and present some information uh, to council. But I just wanted to give you a snap to sh snapshot so you could see what we're doing. And but it does more than just capture that. It also looks at who, you know, what is their family makeup, um, and these are all voluntary questions and contacts. Um, they don't have to answer, so we have the unknown. Uh, you can see that the majority tend to be single, even though there are some couples, and there is, there was one, at, at least at this point, there was one family with children. Um, and you can also see, you know, the vehicle, if, when, once you click vehicle, it breaks down from vehicle to art to that other picture of RV non-operating and operating and, and car operating and not operating but the majority of the of the contacts uh, 72 so far um, have been in vehicles either cars or RVs so we are collecting this data to try and frame a better picture of who's experiencing it and what we're seeing out there um, and I think this is being very helpful to us to to give us a better understanding of uh, of the people that are experiencing homelessness living in RVs and cars so what is our next steps? Well, as I mentioned, we continue to gather data via the survey until the end of March. Uh, we are working on assistance capacity analysis. So the housing exits team that's part of HSBC is doing a portfolio uh, of available housing and that was in the report. You can see part of the work that they've done so far and hopefully we'll have more. And then as such, we'll move along with to the 2020 legislative bills recommended for city council position uh, with Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager Sandy Cedar. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager, and I have four bills for your consideration today, um, two of them regarding mobile home parks, so uh, sort of part of the conversation. So the first one is House Bill 20-1017 um, concerning treatment of individuals with substance use disorders who come into contact with the criminal justice system. So this bill is well-meaning. It provides safe spaces for people to be able to bring um, drugs and be able to get help, but it mandates it in a way that is contrary to the way that we are doing it with our Angel and Network today. This also creates an unfunded mandate. And so even though we appreciate what they're trying to do with this bill and staff is working with the um, bill sponsors, they, the wording has not yet changed. And so at this point, the staff recommends that City Council opposes House Bill 20-1017. House Bill 20-1196 concerning updates to the laws governing mobile home parks. So this bill defines new terms for the purpose of the mobile home park um, and the dispute resolution. Basically, it strengthens the rights of residents in mobile home parks and because this is important, this uh, issue of housing and their rights are important to the City Council, staff recommends the City Council supports 1196. House Bill 20-1201 is another uh, mobile home park bill and basically provides the homeowners in a mobile park the opportunity to purchase the park under specified circumstances. It lays out when notice needs to be given to those residents and how that might be conducted. Um, again, this strengthens the rights of the mobile home park owners um, and so city staff recommends that city council supports 1201. I should note that both 1201 and 1196 are up in committee tomorrow. So if the, com if the council does decide that they would like to support these bills, um, I have some contact information with Boulder County if you're interested in going down and being part of the, the conversation and the bill and you know, signing piece, so um, both committee. The last one, House Bill 20-1294 concerning replacing the term illegal alien with undocumented immigrant as it relates to public contracts for services. This does exactly uh, what you have already done and removes the requirement for illegal alien certification but instead replaces it with undocumented um, immigrant. So of course we would rather have a full repeal but this is way better than nothing. So we would suggest that you support House Bill 20-1294. This is a study session, so I might remind the council that if you'd like to take positions on these bills, your first motion needs to be sus to suspend the rules of procedure to do so, and then to take your positions. Council Member Martin. Council Member Martin. Oh, uh, I move to suspend the rules. Second. And then uh, I move that the count, 
Okay. Oh, do we need to? Well, we'll take we'll take that vote. For, I was just looking to see if anybody had any yeah. objections. No. Uh, uh, we'll take the vote. Uh, any uh, uh, the vote on the motion? Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion carries unanimously, six to zero. Um, and then I move that we the council accept um, Ms. Cedar's recommendations as written. Second. For all four, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any debate? Second. Seeing no debate, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries six to zero with Mayor Bagley absent. I move adjournment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>